she made a name for herself as a nominated member of parliament from 1992 to 1996. She's clearly one of Singapore's foremost and most um, respected orthopedic surgeons. In 2009, she formed a nonprofit organization called WINGS, whose slogan is Active Aging and Living Well. Kanwaljit Soin, welcome to Inconvenient Questions. Thank you, Viswa. Now, this is going to be an exciting uh, conversation we're going to have because, you know, you were an NMP, a nominated member of parliament, uh, who a lot of Singaporeans respected. Respected because you were feisty. You uh, were very much like a pit bull. You would not let go the bite until you got proper answers to your questions. Now, why was that so important? Why was it so important that you bring up these, these inconvenient uh, questions, these inconvenient situations, and demanded answers? Why was that? Was it because you wanted to, to stir problems? Well, I, would, I went in because I was a civil society activist. And I wanted to make it, let, let uh, the public know what is, it is very important to be a civil society activist. You have a definite role and that you can demand accountability and transparency from the government. And then hoping that subsequent people will take on the role of an NMP. That was the first reason. The second reason is because I'm a woman. And whenever a woman gets elected or selected for any position, she, if she fails, then it's sort of, uh, it, the blame seems to be on the whole gender and not only at, on, on a person as an individual. So if I had failed, they said, well, oh, what can women do? She didn't make any difference. So, there so you had to carry the torch. Right. So to speak. So is, is, is your interest in gender, was that the reason for you to form WINGS? Yes, my interest in gender, my interest in older women, because we did a study uh, with an epidemiologist who said in... in we, uh, we meaning? We, we did a study, aware, we meaning AWARE. AWARE and South Foundation, and that uh, older people in Singapore were going to fare worse than older men. Those, that study was done about 15 years ago, and they talked about women and men at the age of 50. One of the main reasons being is that women did not have enough financial savings for their retirement. So they would fare much worse than men. And so it needed an organization to make women aware of that and to prepare them for older age. And do you think you are achieving that outcome over the years? I Is think, it 11 years? I think we are because we were the first organization, the only the gender women only organization for old age and some women feel more comfortable in women only spaces and secondly we are going upstream we're not looking after people after they end up in a wheelchair we were going upstream where we wanted women to to actively prepare for old age to prepare confidently in the area of health in the area of economic opportunity and lastly in social engagement you wrote a book called Silver Shapes of Grey. And it's a lovely book. I, I read the book and, and I couldn't put it down. Uh, highly informative. Obviously, you wrote it in your capacity as a doctor, as a, as a medical practitioner, because you needed to understand. You, but, but you have a beautiful way of communicating complex ideas in a very simple and fascinating way. And thank you for that. Uh, I enjoyed reading it. But, and, and, but what struck me was what you highlighted in that is just as applicable to men as, as it is to women about aging. Of course, aging is universal, but yeah. it's just the effects of aging are worse on women than on men because one, women tend to become widows because they live longer than men and they marry men who are younger. They are financially less prepared and they tend, their health tends to be a little worse than men in old age. But otherwise... Why is that so? Why is that so? That is... The so, health part. I think... Uh, partly is due to hormonal changes and secondly I think it's nature getting her revenge because women live longer nature balances it by making them not so healthy in old age so that men don't have to feel envious of our longer age you sound like you're envious of us men 
No, not at all. Not at all. I, I'm, I'm happy that I've been born a woman. If I was born as a man, I would have been happy too. I, well, I think a lot of men are very happy that you're born a woman. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, okay, quick question, right? Let's get to the, the nub of the issue. What is the difference between getting old and aging? We tend to use these terms interchangeably, but clearly after reading your book, it's very evident that there is a distinct difference between getting older and aging. What is it? Uh, well, one is getting older and aging. Getting older is just your chronological age, what is written on our IC. Every year we get a year older, so we get older and nothing can stop that. But getting Aging, but aging has to do with biological aging, whereby your there's a functional decline from all, of all your organs, so your cells, your molecules, up to you as an organism, so that you function less well, and then leads to dependency, decrepitude, and death. So that's biological aging. Well, chronological aging, it's just the passage of time. Yeah. So, so. A person who is chronologically, chronologically 50 years old could be 30 years old biologically Definitely. or he could, could be 70 years old biologically. Am I correct? Definitely. Because with each, and, with each passing year, some people age biologically three years faster than someone else. Right. So how much of this, this biological aging I guess most people, most people, uh, for most people, the chronological and biological age is in sync, right? More or less, not for most people. All. Would you say that? No, no, no. not at I all. I see. After the age of 50, up to 50, it's most people then begin to biologically age faster. And that's why those who are don't age so well are, are looked upon to and are used as role models because if people did not age biologically so quickly then they would be healthy right up to their 80s and 90s but many yes, older yes. people become frail and dependent in their older age and and that becomes the the image of the elderly Exactly. And, and that, that needs to be changed. That needs to be reversed, right? Because that's, that's what results in, in this, whole, this whole concern about dependency. Definitely. Because they need to be, yeah, they need people to depend on. Right. right. Now, I mean, how many percent, sorry, uh, yeah. Kani, how many percent of this uh, aging-related issues is genetic? And how, how many percent of it uh, is, is behavioral? Well, it's a very good question, Biswa. I think 20 to 25% is genetic and 75 to 80% is environmental and lifestyle. Lifestyle. Wow. So, in other words, what you're saying is that m most of us, if not all of us, have the ability to reverse it, have, have the ability to slow down the process of aging because 70 to 80% is dependent on our lifestyle. Yes. And the environment. Yes. But of course, when I say environment, it's not just dependent on you. I mean, if you come from a, in a poor family who's working hard, you know, then it is harder to slow down aging. But for most of us, if we follow the right lifestyle, our diet, our exercise, and our psychological... Mental. Mental. And mental. Yes. Then the, we will definitely live longer in a healthier way and we can work much longer. Is it true that if I drink two glasses of red wine a day, um, I'll be healthy? Healthier? No, I don't think so, unfortunately. <laughs> come on, come on. No. Because you, but, a, woman, a woman is entitled to drink one glass a day yes. and man two glasses of, of course, red wine a day. Of course. Am I correct? Yes, I quite agree with you. But the thing is, it does not translate into health in a physical way. It translates to health in that it de-stresses you. And people who are less psychologically happier people, they live seven and a half years longer than people who are not so psychologically positive. So your thoughts, the quality of your thoughts is what also helps in the quality of your life by quite a long shot. Yeah, and, and so is this the reason why in your book 
uh, you, you actually made the statement that aging is a disease and should be seen as a disease. Now, it's, it sounds very controversial. Aging is a disease. It's almost as if you're accusing people who are aging as having that disease. No. And the, I, the, the word disease is pejorative. I know. But I'm looking at it from a medical point of view. You see, many doctors, they tend to treat each disease. Uh, as we get older, we get many chronic manifestations and many diseases like cancer, diabetes, heart attacks, Parkinsonism. So each disease is treated separately by a doctor. And, and that, that's called multi-morbidity. Is, is, that, is that the same thing? Multi-morbidity is when you have more than one disease at a time. Okay. You know, okay. but, at a time. But, yes, but but if a patient comes to me was at the age of sixty with heart disease, then I will treat uh, a doctor will treat that. Then later on, the patient may return with cancer. Now, what we don't realize, I mean, not some of us doctors don't realize that all these diseases are manifestations of an underlying condition, and that is aging. So, if we look at aging as a disease and slow down aging then all these other manifestations will appear much later in life so that we lead a long, healthy life and then a short span of illness and then we die. So when do you think we should, we should in earnest, be very, very attentive to our lifestyle? Of At course. At what age? Uh, I mean, if your aging starts from the time you are in a mother's womb. So of course you should start as early as possible, but... I think to start at 50 is reasonable. To start reasonable. at 50 is reasonable to look after your health and to make sure the environmental and lifestyle factors are more conducive. Could you give us a couple of examples of what you, what you would consider critical lifestyle uh, attitude, critical lifestyle behavior, conduct? Okay, I mean, of course, the usual, no smoking and very little drinking. But besides that, it's the food we eat. Not, not, it's not the food we eat, but when we eat it. If we could eat less food and we could fast for longer periods of time, that will spur some of the longevity genes in our body to make our life longer and healthier. So... How does that work? I mean, for example, I mean, what's the medical... Uh, explanation for what, what we hear these days, intermittent fasting. How does that work? Well, one of the ways it works is through, it activates genes in our body called sirtuins, S-I-R-T-U-I-N-S. And these are longevity genes. So these longevity genes then help us to get old slower. So if we can activate, but if we don't activate these genes, then we will age biologically faster. And how do you activate these genes? By exercise, by fasting, by and eating less food. And then there are some other molecules, like you mentioned resveratrol, which you get from drinking alcohol. That's wine. But, but the thing is, you'll have to drink 10 bottles of wine a day to get the right, about one gram of resveratrol. So that's why you would have to take resveratrol. And there are some do, uh, you know, aging scientists that believe that resveratrol works while others are not so sure. So my advice is to stick to eating less, fasting and exercise and being a happy person like you are. So fasting, thank you. So fasting, I want to go back to fasting, intermittent fasting. How many hours should you fast? I mean, for example, let's say you have a meal by eight o'clock in the evening, your dinner. When should your next meal be the following day? All right. Now, intermittent fasting is lauded because it's easy to follow. It is actually better to fast for more than 24 to 36 hours if you can, once or twice a week. That, and during, oh. that, during that time, you can take 500 calories, but that is much more difficult. So now we do intermittent fasting, whereby you should fast for at least 16 hours to up to 20 hours. And then it's not so difficult. After your dinner, you don't take anything, no supper, no breakfast. And then you take a, a very late lunch or an early dinner. Attitude. You, you kind of touched on it just now. You know, you can talk about all these things, but attitude is so important, isn't it? I mean, the attitude as you grow older, you know, not giving up. And you know, that there's this interesting um, story in your book 
uh, if I could share, it's about this French lady that, who, who lived till the age of 122. Uh, her name is, uh, Jean, is Calmant. Jean, Jean Calmant. And uh, this journalist went to interview her. And uh, at the end of the interview, the journalist told her, uh, you know, I'd like to see you next year. You know, or what is what is it? Like, uh, we, we like after, if I, will I be able to see you next year? Will I be able to see you next year? And the answer by this lady who was 100 years old then was, if I quote her, right? Why not? You look perfectly healthy to me. Exactly. She told the journalist that. <laughs> I mean, that's attitude, right? That's brilliant, you know? So how important is this, this attitude? It is so important. They have done studies to show looking at you know, people uh, with a positive attitude and those who don't have a positive attitude, those with a positive attitude, even if they don't look after their diet or exercise, live seven and a half years longer than those who don't have a positive attitude. And, so, and especially, and smiling helps a lot, I hear. Oh, definitely, because the, the good hormones are, uh, you know, released when are you released. smile. So you have to smile more often, and they help your your facial muscles. Muscles as young. well. Wow, wow! I'm learning so much from you, and I'm going to look really good after this. I'm sure. You know, uh, my final question, and this is a very important question, right? Now, what's the implication of all this for public policy in Singapore? You know, in terms of retirement age, you know, in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of CPF withdrawal age, and so on. From a public policy, very quickly, what are your thoughts? First of all, this retirement and re-employment age has been increased by three years for the next 10 years. Now, that is not working because as 10 years pass by, our life expectancy increases by three years. So by, retiring, by delaying the retirement age three years, you're just keeping pace with biological aging you're not really increasing the retirement age. That's one, one uh, public policy thing. The other thing is that if we can keep people healthier longer, they can work longer. And if they can work longer, they don't become dependent. They can have a second or a third career. You may have to modify what type of work they do at, but we must, look, we must work, for, work towards that. And Isn't other, the government already, already looking at that? No, but, as, but as I said, by increasing the retirement age three years, in, it's far too slow. You have what to do you, What do you think time. it should be? It should be, you know, when I was in parliament at that time, they promised to increase the retirement age from 63 to or 65. And now what? How many years have passed by? And it's, it's just still. about at that. So we are far too slow. I know it's because maybe there's a fear that public won't like it. But many people do want to continue working, you know, if they are healthy. So that's one. Second thing is we, the Ministry of Health and the, must concentrate much more on preventive primary care. We are very good where the hospitals are concerned. We are very good at treating cancer and heart disease. But the preventive primary care is not like diabetes. We don't treat diabetes so well and patients end up with all the complications. So our, our primary doctors in the, in the general practitioners and in the polyclinics, they must be given more time, more leeway to treat people with primary, you know, for primary prevention and allow them much more time and not to be so confined by time and fees that they just treat coughs and colds and forget about the other diseases of old age. And I guess to, to add to that would be there must be a, a greater emphasis on awareness. Awareness of, of the things that you talked about, which is very simple for the layman to understand, appreciate, you know, and some of the, 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 the mindset issues uh, and, and the way the aging is viewed by society as a whole. I, I think that attitude needs to change as well. You know, uh, the caricatures that are used to, to symbolize, for example, when you're elderly, you know, the caricature of, an, of a walking stick. Now, all those things, I think, needs to change. It's a holistic thing. Because if, 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 if people get healthy, but you're still viewed as aged, it's not going to help. And so as a whole, there has to be greater awareness. And uh, I'd like to end with, with a very interesting quote by Abraham Lincoln from your book again. You know, um, he said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count. 
It's the life in your years. That's so important. And uh, on that note, Kanwal Jutsoin, thank you very much for joining us in Inconvenient Questions. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye-bye.